for viewing this really moving film together. I'm happy that we're able uh, to pull together what is going to be a really fascinating panel this evening, talking about the film as well as Kennedy and Frost. Tonight's event was a partnership of Concord Museum, the JFK Presidential Library Museum, and the Umbrella Arts Center. I'm Brian Boyles of Mass Humanities. Uh, tonight we welcome four guests and a moderator to talk about the film. Uh, first, we have Amherst College Professor Rodney Cobham Sander, Professor of Black Studies in English and author most recently of I and I, Epitaph for the Self, in the work of V.S. Naipool, Kamal Braithwaite, and Derek Walcott. Ellen Fitzpatrick, presidential historian and author, and most recently the author of The Highest Seat Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency. Jay Perini, professor of English and creative writing at Middlebury College and the author of Robert Frost, A Life, and filmmaker Bester Cram, director of JFK, The Last Speech. It gives me great pleasure to introduce someone uniquely suited to moderate this conversation, the director of the Concord Museum, a past chair of the Mass Humanities Board, and a former director of the JFK Library, my friend, Tom Putnam. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and my thanks, too, for everyone who is watching from home. And if you'd like to ask questions, use the chat feature uh, on YouTube. And um, uh, I was <clears throat> rereading part of Jay Perini's uh, biography, and he mentioned that uh, when Stuart Udall um, told JFK, uh, or mentioned the idea of having Frost be the first poet to speak uh, at a presidential inauguration, JFK's first response was, oh no, because he was worried that he would be upstaged uh, by Frost. We saw in the film that that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, Professor Perini wrote, poetry and power had rarely rubbed shoulders so publicly in the history of our republic. Uh, so let me begin by stating how honored I am to uh, share this virtual stage um, with my colleagues here and rub Zoom box edges uh, with all of you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Bester, why don't we begin with you? You created this wonderful film that we all just watched. Congratulations. Uh, maybe just tell us a little bit of the genesis of the film, how long it took you to um, put it together, and again, this kind of interesting interplay between the history of Frost and JFK, but also interweaving the stories of the Amherst College uh, graduates of 1964. Well, it was uh, essential to weave the stories of the uh, Amherst 64 graduates because they were the ones that really conceived this project. Um, at their 50th reunion, they gathered together to measure sort of how the world had changed and to what degree they had had an impact upon it themselves. And uh, they were distressed, actually, at that reunion meeting, that uh, the world hadn't necessarily improved, uh, given all of the effort that they had tried to make it to improve, and they felt that, in some respects, they had the ability to at least uh, make some comments about where we might be headed in the future by looking at the past. And one of those projects was actually making a film. So they contacted uh, me after having um, gone through a number of different ideas about what the film might be, and we it began to evolve sort of the structure of the film. Um, clearly, they were focused in on understanding the depth of their um, connection to what had happened when they were uh, seniors at Amherst in 60, 1963. Um, and it became apparent to me that, um, you know, understanding the backstory and purely uh, just oh, the relationship of Kennedy and Frost to one another was essential to making a film that was going to satisfy both their needs, but also, um, I think, provide an interest to an audience. Um, and then uh, I, I had no idea of the trip that Frost had made to mm. the Soviet Union. And that, um, we, once we became aware of that, it began to add sort of a, a depth to the film that we felt was interesting. Uh, all films, all stories, really. <laughs> Um, uh, do center around conflict in some way or another. And this was a conflict that is so uh, essential in terms of understanding why uh, Kennedy did end up at Amherst giving this, this speech. Um, and yet, at the same time, also, it's uh, interesting today as we think about how words matter and how essentially in politics, um, friendships can be damaged enormously. And uh, so uh, that was an intriguing part to us. You know, the films, films take a long time just because you're bringing in a number of people and you're wanting to do schedules. But this film, 
was easy to come together, particularly because of people like Ellen and Jay, who had so much to offer in terms of giving us their own personal insights as to how this story might be told. And so my hats are off to to them in terms of uh, how they made this film uh, resonate, both in terms of uh, a piece of history, but also in terms of something that gives us a feeling for today. Uh Rhonda, if I would go to you, just, uh, you know, it's a snapshot of Amherst College, and you just told me recently you spent 36 years teaching there. Um, tell us, you know, how much has the school changed, or, and how much is Kennedy's uh, message that resonates today as it, I mean, does it resonate today as it did then, or uh, what were your reactions in, in seeing the past? Well, it, it looks a lot different. I mean, there are a lot of men in that picture, faculty <laughs> and in the audience. Uh, but um, what struck me when I saw the film was how much had, had remained the same. Mm -hmm. That a lot of those sentiments of the privilege of being at Amherst and the responsibility it brings with, with it are uh, still very much what I hear students say, uh, certain alums say uh, in recent years. And... Um, I'm always surprised. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a hunger for, for, for sort of having meaning that students bring with them. And when they're confronted with a place that says to them, this is what your education could mean, they, there's a way in which they, they often open up that often I think surprises them. Uh, but uh, in terms of the way it's changed physically, uh, Frost Library is almost on its way out because it's, it's the, the world of libraries has changed so drastically in the few years, all well, the move towards the digital and things like that, but but it's a fabulous library. The librarians are among the best. We keep winning all these awards because they've managed, we're the very old building now, very old, can you believe that? And uh, uh, all these changing needs to remain completely relevant and open to helping students and helping us to, to work. They've I've done tons of wonderful work with them. In fact, it was a librarian when I first arrived there 30 years ago who said to me, Oh, you're the new candidate in English. Uh, I have this collection of African manuscripts you may want to look at. And off we went. And I said to myself, I had just come from Yale, and I said to myself, that's where I want to work. Because this was somebody who knew me and knew the work I was doing. And, and this was the librarian. This wasn't even a colleague. So I think Amherst is in many ways the same, but it just looks a lot different. It's a much more diverse space, uh, both in fa the fact that there, there are so many women there, so many students of color, uh, and... Um, and but but the, but there's something about that spirit that, that is very recognizable in what those alums are talking. Okay. Uh, so Alan, why don't you take us back? You were there. Um, it's mentioned in the film, but uh, perhaps a little too briefly, tell us a little bit more about growing up in Amherst and what it was like to be there on that day. Well, it was a great town to grow up in, and still is, I guess. Rhonda tells me, um, and uh, it. Uh, it was really a very, very exciting day, uh, particularly in my family. My um, parents were great fans of JFK. Uh, my father was exactly his age, born in 1917. Uh, they were both uh, in the Navy during the Second World War. Uh, and um, my father uh, was from the Boston area. And uh, he, the whole story of uh, the Kennedys and their immigration from Ireland could have been and was certainly my mother's family's story. And so um, he had a tremendous uh, enthusiasm for Kennedy uh, that was shared by my mother. And uh, so we were very excited to hear that President Kennedy was coming to Amherst. I guess we would have been excited by any president. <laughs> but we were particularly excited by this president. And uh, my whole, you know, the adults, I remember very vividly, uh, my grandmother uh, lived with us. Uh, she died, uh, I think, uh, the year after Kennedy was inaugurated. But uh, to see the enthusiasm and excitement of the adults uh, about Kennedy and his presidency and the sense of, hopefulness and uh, possibility really made a very big impression on me. The day itself is still very vivid in my memory, uh, undoubtedly embellished uh, by time and 
uh, talking about it in this way. One thing I, I do remember, I, I think I was standing, I have, have looked very hard to see if there's a picture of me as a little girl, an 11-year-old girl in the crowd with my friend, uh, Deborah, now Merrill Sands, um, and I have not seen one, but we were pretty close to the, to the fence line at the outside groundbreaking where Kennedy gave some less celebrated but also very interesting remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at those and listening to the audio tape, and there's a line in which he said something about it, this was Amherst being Frost's home, and home is where they always have to take you in, and uh, which is, uh, you know, a wonderful, uh, uh, has wonderful resonance for me since I still uh, have my sister in Amherst and uh, family nearby. So uh, I remember Kennedy very vividly. He was, first there was just a tremendous excitement. It was a beautiful Indian summer day. Started out foggy, the fog burned off. We saw the helicopters come in and land and Memorial Field. There was a little motorcade. And um, I remember uh, in terms of Kennedy himself, this very, this shock of chestnut colored hair, that his hair was very reddish in mm -hmm. the sun. Uh, and, uh, you know, just a very vivid uh, presence and uh, very exciting. I can't say as an 11 year old, I could say, I've now of course read the speeches and listened to the audio tape, but I have no memory of what he said. Uh -huh. Uh, it was just simply being in the presence of our great hero, and he was a great hero to all of us. Uh, Jay, we meet him uh, in the film as uh, we meet Frost as a distinguished uh, poet. But uh, you're so good at can you just explain, especially maybe if there's younger viewers, about what, what was it about Frost and his poetry that made him so special? How, how did he capture this notion of being America's poet? Well, Frost, almost more than any great American poet in the 20th century, was, I think, truly an American voice. Um, if you look at the other poets who are important in the 20th century, not quite. I mean, T.S. Eliot, Wallace Stevens, Elizabeth Bishop. For, the, the, we have great poets, um, but um, certainly for his time, Robert Frost embodied the American common sense, the sense of a pithy way of talking. He was uh, a man of the people. He was a farmer first and a poet second in some, on some levels. He said, I always kept a farm in my backyard. Um, when he wrote his earliest poems, he was living in a little farm in Derry, New Hampshire. He was a chicken farmer. And the poetry arose out of listening to other chicken farmers talk at the local country store. And by listening to the vernacular of that voice, he was able to create, summon from, from, as Shakespeare would say, from thin air, uh, this astonishing American way of talking. And so when we read through a great Frost poem, I think Americans of a certain era certainly felt that this was the country speaking, even though, and it was rooted in place. It was the country north of Boston. It was the country of New Hampshire and Vermont. It was, it was country, good country people speaking in an uneducated, at least officially uneducated way. So Frost was able to bring, put to give some granularity, grace, and, and really memorable beauty to the American way of speaking, to the vernacular. And in the uh, film, you say he was a deceptive poet. Can you give us an example of what you mean by that he was a deceptive? Oh, Frost, Frost, uh, Frost um, pretended to be um, a bit of a rube, to be a countryman, to be a, just an uneducated farmer. But in fact, he'd read his Virgil, he read his Homer, he had read his Shakespeare backwards and forward. His poetry is suffused with quiet allusions to all the great poets of the past, from Homer through uh, uh, Milton and Shakespeare to Wordsworth and Emerson and Thoreau. So he was reading these people, thinking about them, and, and um, engaging in a conversation which the casual reader, especially the reader uneducated in poetry, 
it's not going to really pick up as well as someone who's familiar with, with all of these tonalities. So, but, so Frost is tricky in that sense. He's, he's pulling the wool over our eyes and seeming to be the, 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 the simple old farmer poet, but he's not that. He's, hard. he's an immensely sophisticated poet. And then if you dig into the poems, you often find they mean the opposite of what you think they mean, such as the famous poem, Two Roads Diverge in a Yellow Wood, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean any, it's nothing like. I mean, my high school teacher, Miss Mayer, she, senior po- English class in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, my neighbor was Joe Biden, by the way. She cut out uh, the, the last three lines. My mother was Joe Biden's babysitter, to tell you the truth. So, so she cut my, Miss Mayer cut out the last three lines of the poem. I took the road, less traveled by, and that made all the difference. And she said, class, I want you to really take this to heart. Take the road less traveled. Um, march to the beat of a different drummer. Be an individual. Go your own way. And if you read the Frost poem carefully, it doesn't mean that at all. It, it, it means the opposite of that. The, op- the absolute opposite of that. He spends, as a four stanza poem, the first three stanzas are absolutely devoted to the fact that both of these roads are exactly the same. <laughs> the third stanza begins, and both that, in case you didn't get it, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. I was just thinking about, I was advising f- freshmen last year, and, and a kid comes in and said, oh, Professor Perini, um, I was accepted at Amherst, but I came to Middlebury. I said, oh, well, okay, good choice. He said, well, I'm, now I've been here for a week, and I think I, maybe I made the wrong choice. <laughs> he, said, I call, he said, I called my mother, and I said, Mom, uh, what should I do? She said, oh, well, go to Middlebury this year, and if you don't like it, you, you can probably next year go to Amherst. And I, he said to me, does that seem to you like good advice? And so I pulled out Frost Pond. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and both that morning equally lay and leaves no step and trotted left. <laughs> oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. And I said, No. You cannot go to Amherst College next year and have it be like you're a freshman again. You'll already have had your experience tainted horribly by your year at Middlebury. So I said, that's, you know, I said, you go to Robert Frost and he'll teach you the truth. Bester, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, talk about two uh, connections. One, I understand that actually it was partly these Amherst 1964 grads who uh, talked to David Tavaldi, the head of the former head of Mass Humanities, Brian's predecessor, who helped direct them to you. And uh, I was realizing that you were here at my museum just last year on Martin Luther King Day. We were celebrating your films with Jenny Phillips about prison reform. Um, but uh, someone else in, uh, earlier today was just tipping their hat to you and the number of incredible films that you have done throughout your life. Tell us a little more about the reception of this one. I know there's other... Um, I think there's a book. I think there's a website. Anyway, it, it, it's a film, but it's it's beyond that. But anyway, just tell us a little bit more about what it's been like since the film has been um, uh, premiered. Well, uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Tom. I, th- before I answer that question, I just wanted to add a little anecdote that I think is interesting to pick up on the great description that Ellen gives of that particular day when Kennedy arrived. And it's a, it, it's interesting to the, from the standpoint of telling stories in film, um, when Kennedy arrived, he was um, made to avoid a group of students that were protesting his arrival. Hmm. And so uh, we actually have one photograph in the film where you see somebody holding up some placards. And they're actually, um, it's really a Black Lives Matter protest in its earlier <clears throat> infancy back in 1963. But Kennedy was not to see that, and um, he was brought into a different direction. But I find it fascinating that here we are on the eve of um, of uh, another inauguration, um, and having come through a rather extraordinary year, and um, in talking about 50 years ago, um, uh, Amherst is really, you know, again, part of um, a, a variety of different types of engagement, including um, a very, you know, sustained and engaged group of students that uh, felt that it was important for the president to know 
that there was dissent and that this was a place where dissent took place. Um, it's a shame in my mind that Kennedy didn't see that because I think he probably might have incorporated some of that in his remarks. It's in interesting a way to that, uh, Bester, this point you're making, that's interesting because those demonstrators were uh, college students who were unhappy that Kennedy had been so slow in advancing civil rights and embracing the cause of civil rights. He had given his famous civil rights speech in June, uh, but only after you know much delay. And a month later, he would when he arrived in Dallas, Texas, there were demonstrators on civil rights complaining uh, bitterly that he uh, you know was pressing. Uh, desegregation and um, the uh, they were hostile uh, signs. So the divisions that we're living with oh. and through today, alas, you know, uh, all too relevant. And Ellen, I, I think I may have this. This could be apocryphal, but that really public opinion was somewhat split. And someone asked Kennedy about that, and he said, "Well, then I think I'm going about the right speed, you know, on the civil rights question." Um, it was. Yes, it, it, it was uh, the only time in his presidency where his approval ratings uh, dropped were uh, in that fall as he was uh, pressing the civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. He had the highest approval ratings of uh, any president in uh, the history of polling. Uh, mm -hmm. And his presidency, of course, was short, but... They ticked down, but they averaged over 70% approval, and they went down a little bit from that in that fall before he died. Uh, Rhonda, in your remarks on the centennial, you commented in reading uh, JFK's speech, you were struck that he used the word diversity three times, and maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, yeah uh, he, and um, he, I, I, I would, I would, I can't, I can't repeat them all. But certainly at the end of the speech, he talks about uh, diversity, and then he replaces it in three words he uses, and the last one he uses is distinction. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he, he, I think he's speaking to something I heard in the um, the the alums who was speaking in the in the movie that we think you know I started off by saying you get this sort of phalanx of of white men in in the movie very beginning but uh but you do hear when the when the individuals speak how how diverse they thought of themselves as being you know they came from very very different backgrounds they came from from very different sort of socioeconomic levels which is always something that Amherst prided itself on, on doing and uh and and he he is constantly this the speech I I was I was pretty stunned myself I I you know I, I'm sort of Ellen's generation and I remember him only as a child in the Caribbean around the um, the whole uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And that was just like this scary thing that we didn't really know what would happen. Uh, and there was a certain amount of, you know, Cold War, we, we, we were trapped in it in some ways in the Caribbean. So we had a very different perspective. But but when I finally read the speeches, I was stunned at how how the poetry worked in his writing, because I just ended up one day in the library, in Frost Library, sitting there, just going down a rabbit hole of listening to or reading all of Kennedy's speeches and just being stunned by the poetry of his speeches. But then last night after I listened to the movie, I, I switched from that, to, I watched the movie, I switched from that to watching the PBS special on um, um, black women in the 60s. It was, it was all about... Um, uh, uh, the first, the first women who who were in in the movies, uh, Diane Carroll and Lena Horne and all those people, mm -hmm. and I was stunned to realize that those those protests and that way of thinking about about poetry, about rhetoric, uh, James Baldwin, people like that, were going on at exactly the same time that, that that Kennedy was was speaking, and it really gave. I had never realized how closely the two of of those. I mean, obviously, you know, it all happens at the same time, but literally some of the stuff that was going on in that documentary was going on at the same time as the documentary I had just been watching. And it made me wonder about what, what the influence of that rhetoric, that, that rhetoric around race, that very poetic re re rhetoric around race uh, on the stage and in the writings of people like Baldwin, what kind of effect that might have had on Kennedy in thinking about some of these ideas 
around power. You know, when he talks about poetry, um, you know, power corrupts, uh, make, make earth and poetry cleanses. I'm wondering, I, I thought about that kind of poetry and wondered what, what he was, what that meant to him. Um, that's a nice segue, Ellen. Can you just talk a little bit about the, the writing, the drafting of uh, Kennedy's remarks and the edits that he made? Yes, uh, it, it's interesting because the first draft of the speech was written by Ted Sorensen, who was such an amazing wordsmith, uh, but Kennedy didn't like the speech, and I was looking at the draft uh, again today, and he was right. It, he, he thought it was stale and really, uh, you know, lacked his, uh, the, the normal power uh, that... Um, that Sorensen was so great at delivering. And so Kennedy um, asked Arthur Schlesinger to work on the speech for him. And um, so uh, Schlesinger did a nice job, and much of what later was read uh, was Schlesinger's work. But when they were on the airplane coming up to Western Massachusetts, Kennedy, um, you know, uh, I guess uh, Schlesinger was sitting with him in the cabin and then went off and uh, Kennedy turned to whomever was with him and he said, you know, I still don't really like this speech very much. And he worked on it further himself and made further edits to it. Um, and so, uh, you know, he clearly wanted to say something about the arts and the importance of cultural and intellectual life. Uh, and uh, also about education and uh, the responsibility of privileged young people to serve their country. And um, so it, it, it's interesting that it wound up being seen as, as uh, such an important speech uh, because my, he, he um, wasn't entirely happy at the beginning of it. I'll give my favorite edit, which when people often ask me, you know, did JFK write his own speeches, the answer is, no, but uh, he made some beautiful edits. And so Schlesinger had written, when power inebriates, yeah. poetry invokes sobriety. Yeah. And JFK changed it to, when power corrupts, poetry cleanses. Yeah. I mean, it's, such it's, such, it's, it's so much better as a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> I love that one, you know, the move from uh, temperance to alchemy. It's such a, it's such a yeah. way of... Okay, let me uh, throw a different line at you. A second favorite uh, line of the speech for me is... Uh, Kennedy invokes the first line of the poem, Acquainted with the Night, where, and he says, mm -hmm. because Robert Frost knew the midnight as well as the high noon, because he understood the ordeal as well as the triumph of the human spirit, he gave his age strength with which to overcome despair. Uh, tell us a little bit about that poem, Acquainted with the Night. Well, Frost um, is a, a poet of darkness, and um, so many of his, that's where, again, we have the misconception of Robert Frost as the sweet old man, grandfatherly poet. He was a poet of, of deep darkness who had had children die early on, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He had troubles with his wife. He, I mean, when you think of these darknesses he went through, one child died when it went at two years old, another child had died in childbirth. One of his daughters died in childbirth. Um, his son, Carol, his only son, committed suicide. He had many, many, many terrible personal tragedies. And uh, I think he was himself suffering throughout his life from life from a, a kind of bipolar disorder. Uh, he mm -hmm. would go for weeks on end when he wouldn't leave his bedroom. He'd keep the shades drawn. And then he'd go through a manic phase when he'd walk all night long through the woods by himself, talking to himself. So he was a man of tremendous deep feeling, uh, a great instability. Um, and, and I think it's out of the pain that the greatness comes. So he says, I have been one acquainted with the night. He's, he's walked up and down the streets. Mm -hmm beyond the farthest city light. Uh, you know, he's, he's really a man who, um, who finds, he, as he says in one of his poems, uh, snow falling and falling fast, oh fast. He talks about the snows inside of him. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. And I think Kennedy could identify with that in Robert Frost. And he, he understands that it's the pain I mean, look, he writes, I actually, Rhonda, I love what you said about, I never quite put together, but, you know, you could read any of these lines of Kennedy's speech and hear Martin Luther King saying them. <laughs> it's the same, it's the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the cadence, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, the cadences, right? You know, when power leads man toward arrogance, 
Poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power, poet, power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. I mean, this is amazing. I look forward to America, which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, but for its civilization as well. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. King could have written all those words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the sentiments are the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think Kennedy was, it's amazing that it's at the same time uh, as the I Have a Dream speech and all those great speeches. Mm -hmm. I mean, not far off that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, within the same ballpark uh, of, a de of a, you know, so we're getting, yeah. I mean, it's again, it's traditions of, of the, the, the syntactical cadences, antiphonal clauses of of of, uh, of African American rhetoric, really, mm -hmm. that, that that Kennedy is able to play with, and yeah. and, so, and so he digs into the again. He understands the sound of what Frost called the sound of sense. Yeah, He's digging in, you wouldn't have to know what the words were if you heard Kennedy reciting these lines through a closed door. And you didn't know what the words were. You'd still know. You know still understand going. the sentiment. Mm -hmm. Would still be there because it's in the tone, which is in the syntax. And the the way clauses are are built up and reversed sentiments are are played off each other. And so it's a beautiful. Uh, can, I mean, what what a, what a great person! Can, I, mean, I got chills when I first heard that Kennedy speech. And this okay. afternoon, just in preparation for this, I played the I went online and just played the whole speech on audio again, and it just blew me away. I thought, you know, wow, this is this is this is this is poetry, pure poetry. And political rhetoric, and when you think we are, and it's such a contrast to what we've been hearing in the last four years. You know? <laughs> don't, don't, don't even go there. Don't even go there. <laughs> uh, Esther, it looked like you had something you wanted to say. Well, well it's, I, I love this discussion because it's also a reminder of how important the delivery, the sound of the poet is. Yeah. And when you hear Frost in his own words say, I am acquainted with the night. There is no doubt in your mind. Yeah. When you, you can read it, as you've just helped us again, Jay, think of how intense those words are and how well-crafted they are. But yeah. then when you hear them actually from the author and you know that they've come from deep inside as he utters them, much the same as how I feel about Kennedy when he has got his cadence going and his yeah. sense of believing in his own promise makes me a believer in his promise. Well, you think about uh, that phrase itself, acquainted with the night. Uh, what came to mind as I was listening to Jay talking was uh, thinking about Kennedy as a young man in his 20s, in the dead of night on a burning sea, with his PT boat having been cut in half, and uh, the men that he was... Uh, commanding, uh, drowning around him, attempting to rescue them and uh, save his own life in the process. I mean, I think the men of that generation, having lived through the experience of war as uh, he did in that immediate way, um, you know, the kind of terror that... Uh, we now have words for to describe the after effects of that experience that they all came back and uh, were expected to just pick up their lives and uh, all of this was submerged and go on and, you know, get married, have families. And I think it left a very deep imprint on them and, and uh, certainly on their children as well. It makes you understand how, um, how cutting, how, how upset he must have been about, about Frost seeing that line about American men not mm -hmm. having the power to Too love their fight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, even though you know where that, you, 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 and also you can understand why that's so, such an attractive idea to, to, to Frost. So it's a strange combination. I'm going to wrap us up, um, Ellen. This is an unfair question without much time left, but I listened to the lovely talk that you gave at UNH, thinking about your career. And um, uh, I mean, you end with a very positive notion of what JFK represents in our history. Maybe you could just try to share a sentence or two about how you think of him in history. 
Well, I, I'm, I'm constantly fascinated by his story um, and all of the complexities of uh, Kennedy as a human being, all that we learned about him uh, and how much uh, more complicated a person he was than uh, people knew in those days about him as president and uh, how his reputation has you know, waxed and waned with one revelation or another over time or less appealing or attractive things about him. But in the end, I'm always brought back to a letter, a condolence letter that I read at the Kennedy Library in which uh, a young man uh, said, uh, actually not a young man, I'm probably a man of Kennedy's generation, uh, wrote and said, a man like this comes along once in a hundred years. And um, the last line of the letter was, you know, we have wasted a great man. And I do think that there was uh, something about Kennedy. He was, he was much greater uh, than, um, he evoked something great in, uh, in, the American people and in his historical moment that was perhaps uh, greater than, uh, you know, his, uh, his individual failings that uh, have become uh, so much a part of the discussion about him. And so what he evoked in the American people, uh, the sense of idealism and possibility, uh, really is, is evergreen. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, Jay, maybe you could tell the story that I've heard you tell in other settings about Robert Frost and uh, reciting the Fire and Ice um, poem. It's just a lovely, lovely story I think our viewers would like to hear. Uh, yes, yeah, so you heard me tell it once before. It's the story of um, Frost's um, start at the Breadloaf Writers Conference, which is still going on after 80 years. And there's a place called the Little Theater, and Frost would always insist on giving the final reading on the final night of the conference. And he always ended with fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. And this woman recently stopped me and said, well, Mr. Prini, I wish I had met you when you were writing the book on Frost because I was at one of Frost's readings in, at Breadloaf in 1954, and he ended with fire and ice. And then there was a huge applause, and he blew out through the west doors, and he walked down the lawn and, at, at, at night, and there was a big moon, and he smoked, started smoking a cigarette. And I went up to him. The, I was the only person there. I said, Mr. Frost, um, may I ask you a question? He said, what? A question? Yes, may I just ask you one question? Oh, go ahead, girl. What is it? She said, Mr. Frost, what did that poem mean, fire and ice? I said, what did it mean? Dear, it meant this. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. It's a way of saying that poetry means what it says. <laughs> and Frost... And meant what he said, and Kennedy meant what he said. And I think it's that authenticity in the yeah. person that no matter what the words are, if you're delivered from the core of the heart and the mind, fusing, when Kennedy, you know, says when power uh, leads us, whatever, and poetry cleanses us. When poetry, you know, destabilizes, power destabilizes us. Poetry stabilizes us. It's beautiful. Yeah? Yeah. Uh -huh. Wanda, we prearranged for you to read a Frost poem. Yeah. Closes out, and then I was going to so, turn it back to Brian. So, so unfair. After all that we learned about Frost <laughs> and the vernacular, you asked me to read it, who does not have an American accent. Uh, no, I think it would be, be but it is, to but his, but his world is my world. I mean, I've lived here for a long time, and I, 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 um, I, the world that he describes is the world I see. He's helped me to learn how to live in Amherst. And, um, this, this poem that, that you thought we'd end with, Spring Pools, uh, brings me back to these walks that so many of us have been having during the lockdown. What, what I do most of all is just walk through the countryside around Amherst 
and and I've been watching the changing vernal pools and all kinds of things in the woods as I walk each day on my regular path. I always do the same path. And uh, so this poem really speaks to, to some of that, some of that change. So I'll try to do it justice, but I'm not crossed. Uh, Spring Pools by Robert Frost. These pools that, though in forests, still reflect the total sky almost without defect. And like the flowers beside them chill and shiver, will, like the flowers beside them, soon be gone. And yet, not out by any brook or river, but up by roots to bring dark foliage on. The trees that have it in their pent-up buds to darken nature and be summer woods, let them think twice before they use their powers to blot out and drink up and sweep away those flowery waters and these watery flowers from snow that melted only yesterday. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Bester, once again, we tip our head to you. Thank you for this wonderful film that brought us all together. And I'll turn it to Brian to ha have a parting word. How fortunate we are to have a conversation like this, uh, particularly as uh, we said at the beginning, uh, saying goodbye to one administration and uh, hello to a new administration with some sense of hope. We spent this time uh, looking at words, uh, whether it was Frost's or Kennedy's uh, or Martin Luther King's or Baldwin's. We went from poems to eulogies to letters of condolence. I would close with uh, uh, words of legislation, the words that helped found the National Endowment for the Humanities and National Endowment for the Arts, which were inspired by this speech. And I think you can see the parallel so strikingly um, in some of the things we talked about tonight. Uh, one quote from the founding legislation. The world leadership which has come to the United States cannot rest solely upon superior power, wealth, and technology, but must be solidly founded upon worldwide respect and admiration for the nation's high qualities as a leader in the realm of ideas and of the spirit. Thank you all so much for sharing your ideas and spirit and all this time with us tonight. Thanks, Tom, for putting this together with us, the Concord Museum, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and the Umbrella uh, Arts Center in Concord. Stay tuned for the next event, but thanks so much uh, for celebrating this fine film and for sharing in the humanities tonight. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thank you all. It was fun. <laughs>